Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the inaugural event in our 2022-2023 Virtual Scholarly Seminar Series titled Surviving the Long Wars. My name is Rona K. Kapadia. I'm an Associate Professor of Gender and Women's Studies at the University of Illinois, Chicago, and one of the co-organizers of this series, along with my museum and exhibition studies colleagues, Therese Quinn and Aaron Hughes. We are delighted that you have all decided to join us today. To provide an image description, I am a late 30 something brown person with a beard and a light green glasses with gold accents in my home office on the Northwest side of our city of Chicago. Behind me, there is a bright red bookcase with stacks of books on top and a dark gray wall, as well as artist prints over my shoulder of iconic images of a young Angela Davis and Frank Ocean respectively. We'll be getting started in just a few moments, but I wanna offer some access notes for our discussion and webinar today. You'll note that live captioning is available for this webinar. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, you can click CC live transcript, and then it will show subtitles. You can also access the captions in a separate stream text web browser window. We've just dropped the link um, in the chat and we'll redrop it periodically throughout the session for the stream text. After my opening remarks, the chat feature of this webinar will be turned off for attendees um, throughout the session. Um, and the reason for this is that we are offering this as an access consideration for those of us using screen readers. But we do invite you to post comments and questions throughout today's conversation in the Q&A feature, which you can also file, find at the bottom of your Zoom screen, which we will address as time permits. Although our focus today is on a moderated discussion with our speaker, Professor Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz, and one of our NEH veteran fellows and artists, Gina Herrera. If there are any other access needs, please post them in the Q&A and we'll do our best to meet them in real time. Please note that we are recording today's webinar and a digital archive of all of our seminar events will be made available on our website at a later date, survivingthelongwars.online. That's my cue to inform you to stay tuned for future events in our series, including a talk by Professor Kyle Mays of UCLA on Thursday, October 13th. We'll drop the Eventbrite information for that event in the chat now as well. So to start off today's event, we want to acknowledge and honor the original peoples of the Chicagoland area, the Three Fires Confederacy, the Potawatomi, Odawa, and Ojibwe nations, as well as other tribal nations that know this area as their ancestral homelands, including the Menomi, Ho-Chunk, Miami, Peoria, and Sac and Fox, as well as their descendants. Further, we acknowledge this land as the current home to one of the largest urban Native American communities in the United States. Native people are part of Chicago's past, present, and future. Finally, we are reminded that a land acknowledgement, especially by non-Native diasporic settler people of color like myself, should not just be a rhetorical gesture, but instead the animating force and material ground from which any critique of violence, imperialism, militarism, and warfare that we forward here today is made possible. To acknowledge is to act, and we encourage everyone to consider the multitude of ways to translate knowledge and thoughts into active support for indigenous peoples and communities locally, nationally, and around the world. By way of introduction, we are a collective of scholars, curators, and artists at UIC working at the nexus of critical ethnic studies, feminist and queer studies, contemporary art and museum and exhibition studies. We've been collaborating for over a year on a national endowment for the humanities funded project. Surviving the Long Wars explores the multiple overlapping histories that shape our understanding of warfare, as well as the alternative visions of peace, healing and justice generated by diverse communities impacted by war. Our project attempts to visualize the parallels and intimacies between the two longest military conflicts in US history, the American Indian Wars of the 18th and 19th centuries and the 21st century global war on terror from the vantage point of contemporary black, indigenous and people of color BIPOC veteran artists, as well as those most impacted by these wars. Today's talk by Professor Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz is the first in a virtual scholarly seminar series on new directions in comparative ethnic and native indigenous studies on the histories and futures of native rebellion alongside contemporary US militarism and warfare. Our next talks are scheduled for Thursday, October 13th, as I've mentioned with Professor Kyle Mays of UCLA 
and Thursday, November 10th with Professor Lale Khalili of Queen Mary University of London. The seminar series is part of a year-long UIC graduate seminar and NEH Dialogues on the Experiences of War discussion program taught by our colleague and veteran artist, Aaron Hughes. The class is exploring the legacies of US settler colonial military conflicts through the artistic practices and experiences of BIPOC veterans and those communities most impacted by these war regimes, including native and indigenous descendants, and West and Southwest Asian and Muslim diasporic communities as well. Our entire project culminates in the second Veteran Art Triennial and Summit in spring 2023 at the Chicago Cultural Center, Hyde Park Art Center, and Newberry Library. And we're looking very much looking forward to welcoming you to Chicago and to these spaces in the spring of 2023. Throughout, we hope to spotlight new scholarship, forge innovative community collaborations, diminish silos in our interdisciplinary scholarly fields, and most importantly, to highlight the role of art and culture in the historic and ongoing movement against militarization, war, and empire. Surviving the Long Wars is organized by Aaron Hughes, myself, Therese Quinn, Joseph Lefthand, Anthony Torres, and Amber Zora, with the support from the University of Illinois Chicago Institute for the Humanities Innovation Grant, the UIC Award for Creative Activity, the Chicago Cultural Center, the Hyde Park Art Center, the Newberry Library, the D. Mill Art Fund, and the National Endowment for the Humanities Dialogues and the Experiences of War Grant. Special thanks to Margaret Fink from the, from the UIC Disability Cultural Center, Tal Foster of the Native American Support Program, and Zainab Ilal, and Rachel Dukes, our amazing graduate assistants at UIC on this project, as well as Tina Dillon, our captioner today. It's now my pleasure to briefly introduce our moderator and NEH veteran artist fellows, Gina Herrera, who will be introducing our esteemed speaker, Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz today. We will also drop these bios in the Q&A feature as well. Um, Gina Herrera is a contemporary artist from Chicago who currently resides in California. She received her BFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and the MFA from the University of the Arts in Philadelphia. Her work explores environmental justice and pays homage to Mother Earth. She is currently creating and exhibiting work in galleries around the country, as well as exploring avenues for creating larger scale permanent public art projects to bring her message of environmental mindfulness to even more people. Her first temporary public art installation was in residence at the Valencia Town Center in Santa Clarita, California for the first four months of 2016. And from 2017 to 2022, an installation was on display at the South Bend Museum in South Bend, Indiana. Earlier this year, her work is featured on an episode of Bel Air on the Peacock Network. I'm gonna to have to check that out. And Herrera's dedication to service extends to all aspects of her professional life from her almost 25 years in the United States military to educating and inspiring the next generation as an art teacher at Arvin High School and adjunct professor at Bakersfield College. It's my pleasure to welcome you, Gina, um, who will be introducing our speaker today. Gina, please take it away. Well, thank you, Ronick. Um, I am, as he said, I am a art teacher. I am wearing glasses and I am a fur, fur mama. I have two hot dogs that I love extremely. And I am honored to be here today as an NEH veteran fellow to introduce our first scholarly seminar with Professor Dunbar Ortiz. Her talk today, U.S. Settler Colonialism, Endless War and Genocide, will be informative to understand the connections and contradictions between the Indian Wars and the global war on terror. Personally, as a military veteran of the global of the global war on terrorism with Tezuki Puebla and Costa Rican heritage, I am interested in understanding these entanglements. I am specifically interested in how they might inform my artwork. I remember the mountainous trash heaps left by the US military in Iraq, which inspired my art practice to focus on environmental justice for Mother Earth. I cannot help but think these things are all connected and I look forward to hearing Dr. Dunbar Ortiz's thoughts on this topics. Dr. Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz grew up in rural Oklahoma, child of a tenant farming family. She received the BA in history at San Francisco State College 
and a master's and PhD degrees in history at the University of California, Los Angeles. The MFA in creative writing at Mills College and the diploma in the International and Comparative Law of Human Rights in Strasbourg, France. A historian, writer, and professor emeritus at California State University, she is an author or editor of 15 books, including Root of Resistance, A History of Land Tenure in New Mexico, An Indigenous People's History of the United States, Loaded, A Disarming History of the Second Amendment, and Not a Nation's of Immigrants, Settler Colonialism, White Supremacy, and a History of Erasure and Exclusion. She is at work on a book of essay on Christian nationalism in the U.S. to be published in 2023. Her talk today is titled U.S. Settler Colonialism, Endless War and Genocide. Welcome, Professor Dunbar Ortiz. Thank you, Gina. Let me find my text. <laughs> There we go. So thank you so much, uh, Gina and everyone there for organizing this important series. And it's an honor to be uh, the first guest. And um, I wish I could be there with you to meet you all in person. I am um, trying to find my PDF. I'm a historian. So this is very important, I, I think, to understand that um, not everything is, you know, is so important to have from a historical point of view. One of my favorite uh, historians, a Haitian historian, um, said sometimes there's just too much history that confuses us. But I think in the case of the United States, that actually um, nothing about the present can be understood uh, without the um, understanding of the formation of the United States, settler colonialism, uh, and that there's just a lot of confusion even among progressives about why the United States is so militaristic and why it keeps doing the same things over and over again. Um, and um, whatever movements we have in the past seem to simply not, um, not to um, last basically. So I wanted to, um, on just a second, I'm trying to take my, there it is. So I, I, uh, I want to go back into the formative, um, the formative period. First of all, the status of the military itself in uh, popular imagination. A recent poll regarding the opinions of US government institutions report that uh, with uh, wide agreement across party lines that 84% respond that they have full confidence in the military. That's compared to executive Congress and the Supreme Court that are rated in single digits in stark comparison. So the popularity of the military is not new. It's fundamental and original. So if we want to get into originalism, uh, we have to tell the whole story and not just the Supreme, the present Supreme Court's story of originalism. And we must come to grips with the obvious fact that the United States was founded as a fiscal military state. That term is fairly new, but it's an important one to understand. It's a European settler state made for war. 
is designed in the 1787 Northwest Ordinance to conquer the continent. That was the goal, it was a written goal. And then to go on to China and connect and conquer the Pacific and Asia, written into the Northwest Ordinance, which is never taught in schools. It's an easy text, it's online, every word of it. So what happened with that, uh, that process was erasure of multiple nations, uh, dis uh, dispersion, and millions of inhabitants uh, were replaced with Euro-Americans and untold uh, thousands and thousands uh, were killed. So this required the full armed participation of settlers with the promise of land becoming men of property. It took a century of genocidal wars to accomplish with indigenous nations, survivors incarcerated in reservations by 1890. Wounded knee, 1890 sort of metaphorically anyway, um, marks the end of armed resistance, not that resistance didn't continue and still does. It's essential to acknowledge the fact that the United States has been at war since its founding, continuing the colonial wars that secured the 13 colonies during a period of 170 years. It is impossible to find a single day in United States history when some part of its armed forces, including covert operations since 1950s, was intervening somewhere. The roots of the United States military culture can be found in what historians describe as savage war, called petite guerre or counterinsurgency in military annals. It is theorized that the United States' first way of war, um, it, it, uh, by historian, military historian John Grenier calls it the United States' first way of war. And Grenier actually himself is uh, a professor at the Air Force University in Baltimore. And uh, I, I mean, in Colorado. And he is, um, he sees this army that was formed, the military that was formed in that process uh, to be the essence of the military today, uh, counterinsurgency. So this way, a war, though, dates back to the British colonial period and was a combination of unlimited war and irregular war, a military tradition that accepted, legitimized, and encouraged attacks upon and the destruction of non-combatants, villages, and agricultural resources in shockingly violent campaigns to achieve their goals of conquest. Grenier notes that also, also, although in most US wars in the 20th and 21st centuries, the military begins combat as a regimented force, but invariably turns to that first way of war, counterinsurgency, almost a knee-jerk reaction. The so-called war on terror official behavior following 9-11 should not have come as a surprise if people know that history. What distinguishes US militarism is not only the amount or type of violence involved, but especially the triumphal mythology attached to that violence and its political uses even today. This way of war was largely devised and enacted by landed settlers, many of them slavers, who formed the basis for the founding ideology and the colonialist military strategy of the independent United States. And this approach to war is still being practiced almost as a reflex with proud memories of triumphant past campaigns. In the 20th century, the United States carried out large-scale regular warfare alongside counterinsurgency 
in the Philippines, Europe, uh, Korea, Vietnam, as well as smaller scale and prolonged invasions and occupations and coups in the Philippines, Cuba, Nicaragua, Guatemala, Haiti, Iran, the Dominican Republic, Argentina, Chile, on and on and on. Uh, and um, the covert uh, counterinsurgencies also um, in Africa, uh, in Angola, in Southern Africa, um, against the national liberation movements there. And so coming up to the 21st century in Iraq and Syria, uh, Yemen, among others. The current, and then there's the current proxy war with Russia, mirroring the US proxy war with the Soviet Union in the 1980s in Afghanistan. Counterinsurgency's main goal is to destroy the collective will of the people targeted or their capacity to resist, employing any means necessary, but invariably falling back on attacking civilians and their support systems, especially food supplies and their fields, which is actually against the laws of war that were uh, devised in the 19th century. The Anglo colonists in North America called it food fight, now called special operations or low intensity conflict and even blatantly as in Afghanistan counterinsurgency. This kind of warfare was used against indigenous communities by settler militias in the initial British colonies of Virginia, Massachusetts and spread as other colonies were established then legalized in the US Constitution, Second Amendment to the Bill of Rights, which mandated settlers' individual rights to organize and take and hold indigenous lands, as well as to control enslaved Africans with slave patrols. Settler militias sought to disrupt every aspect of resistance, as well as to obtain intelligence through scouting and taking civilians as hostages. They did so by destroying ind indigenous villages and fields and intimidating and slaughtering enemy non-combatants populations. These voluntary militias made up of individual civilians called rangers in the colonial period are what are referenced as militias as they came to be called in the second amendment. During the period 1607 to 1814, the architecture of the US military was forged, leading to its reproduction and development into the present. This formative period generated the problematic characteristics of the US way of war and thereby the characteristics of US civilization, which few historians and citizens have come to terms with. During the 1600, late 1600s, Anglo settlers in New England began the routine practice of scalp hunting and ranging. By that time, the non-indigenous population of the British colony in North America had increased sixfold from 1607 to more than 150,000 European population which meant that the settlers were intruding on more and more of the indigenous nation's homelands, pushing people out. Indigenous resistance followed in, the 16, in 1676 and 77, uh, eliminationist warfare that the settlers called King Philip's War. The, the Wampanoag people and their indigenous allies attacked the settlers' isolated farms that had been seized from the Wabanego using methods that relied on speed and caution and striking and retreating, and of course, possessing a perfect knowledge of the terrain that is resistance using guerrilla warfare. The settlers, the white settlers, scorned this kind of people's resistance as skulking and responded by destroying indigenous villages, burning them to the ground and everyone in them, driving them out and taking their land. 
burning their fields, homes, villages, and food supplies. But as effective indigenous resistance continued, the commander of the, of the Plymouth militia, Benjamin Church, studied, he was a, a military uh, expert, studied uh, Wampanoag tactics in order to develop a more effective kind of preemption or counterinsurgency. Although they didn't call it that at the time, but that's what it's come to be called. He petitioned the colony's governor for permission to choose 60 to 70 settlers to serve as scouts, as he called them, for what he termed wilderness warfare. Although the indigenous communities were all farming and fishing villages, not there was no wilderness. In July 1676, the first settler organized militia was the result. The Rangers force was made up of 60 male settlers and 140 captured and conscripted indigenous men. They were ordered to quote, discover, pursue, fight, surprise, destroy, or subdue the enemy. In Church's words, um, that is the total, total war against civilians. The inclusion of, of indigenous fighters on the colonist side was not unique to British colonists, colonists in North America. Rather, the practice that marked the character of European and Euro-American colonization and occupations of non-European peoples from the beginning uh, through the 20th century national liberation movements. The settler rangers could learn from their native aids, then discard them. Some indigenous communities allied with settler war making against their indigenous neighbors, igniting civil wars. This always turned out badly for the colonized native when the settlers turned on them as well. Increasingly, the very native peoples formed confederations, increasing their power to resist. These confederations uh, especially developed uh, after the United States was independent. The native communities of New England continued to resist by burning Anglo settlements and killing and capturing settlers for ransom. As an incentive to recruit fighters, colonial authorities introduced a program of scalp hunting that became a permanent and long lasting element of settler warfare against indigenous nations. During the Pequot War, Connecticut and Massachusetts colonial officials had offered bounties initially for the heads and murdered uh, indigenous peoples, and later only for their uh, scalps, which were more portable in large numbers uh, because uh, they got bounties for them and had to carry them to market. But scalp hunting became routine even outside of warfare when there was no war going on, uh, simply killing native people and taking uh, their scalps in to sell. And it became a very profitable pursuit. Um, this was after an incident on the northern frontier of the Massachusetts colony. The, the scalp market began in earnest after 1697 when settler Hannah Dutton was taken hostage and during the night murdered her 10 Abenaki captors in a nighttime escape presenting their 10 scalps to the Massachusetts General Assembly, which rewarded her with bounties for two men, two women, and six children that she had killed. However, it was not until more than a century later that the Dustin story was revived as a patriotic white nationalist narrative during the Andrew Jackson presidency. Dustin's deed was celebrated as the first Anglo-American woman in North America to be cast as a heroic statue. Dustin has been, had been famous for a few years during her own lifetime after her escape from captivity and her bloody scalp trophies were highly publicized at the time. But she was pretty much forgotten until the 1820s when stories about her 
began to appear in print and increased in numbers through the 1880s and definitely was a factor in um, reintroducing uh, uh, scalp hunting uh, in, the, in the West. Um, not just one, but three major monuments were erected to uh, Dutton's honor. Lionized as a folk, he folk hero, Dustin's story was employed during the continuing bloody and genocidal Jacksonian wars against native peoples to characterize settler and army violence as defensive and virtuous, necessary, even feminist. The statues still stand in the Boston area today. Scalp hunting became a lucrative commercial practice from the early 18th century onward. The settler authorities had hit upon a way to encourage settlers to take off on their own or with a few others to gather scalps at random for the reward money. In the process, they established the large scale privatization of war within Anglo-American frontier communities. We might see a through line to the present private armed white nationalists that were empowered by Donald Trump. During nearly two centuries of British colonization on the Atlantic shore of North America, generations of settlers gained experience as so-called Indian fighters outside any organized military institution. Anglo-French conflict may appear to have been the dominant factor of European colonization in North America during the 18th century. But while large regular armies fought over geopolitical goals in Europe, Anglo settlers in North America waged deadly irregular warfare against the indigenous nations. The chief characteristic of irregular warfare or counterinsurgency is that of extreme violence against civilians. In this case, the tendency to seek the utter annihilation, pacification, or removal of the indigenous population. In cases where a rough balance of power existed between the white settlers and uh, surrounding native people, as this, it was the situation in virtually every frontier war until the first decade of the 19th century, Anglo-American settlers were quick to turn to extravagant violence to reach their goals. Most military historians ignore the so-called Indian Wars from 1607 to 1890, as well as the 19, uh, 1846 to 48 invasion and occupation of Mexico. But these wars formed the platform, um, the genealogy of officers and mindset of US military actions in the US Civil War and after in the rest of the world. Uh, almost all this, uh, the Civil War generals on both sides, Confederacy and, um, and the United States had, uh, had been in, in, sometimes in both the Third Seminole War of the 1840s and in the Civil War, now fighting against each other. Andrew Jackson carried out the original plan envisioned by the founders, particularly Jefferson, initially as a Tennessee militia leader, then as an army general who led counterinsurgent wars against the Muscogee Creek and Seminoles in Georgia and Florida. And finally, as a president who engineered the forced expulsion of all native peoples east of the Mississippi to the designated Indian Territory, Oklahoma. A mystique developed among settlers around the militia rangers persona that brought Jackson to the presidency as the most popular president ever. This persona involved a certain identification with the native enemy making the settler as Native American rather than European. Following independence, this mystique became a part of popular culture as well as military culture, as we can see with Army Rangers and Navy SEALs, as well as the Marine Corps in today's wars. 
During the second half of the 19th century, the Army of the West, nearly all soldiers and officers from the Mexican War and the Third Seminole War, warred against the people peoples in the former Mexican territory of the Southwest. And after the Civil War, the Northern Plains, peoples to the Pacific with officers and soldiers empowered by four years of combat and more lethal weaponry accrued during the Civil War. Military analyst Robert Kaplan, an enthusiast for covert wars and US Special Forces, rightly challenges the concept of manifest destiny. He argues that it was not inevitable that the United States should have an empire in the Western part of the continent. Rather, he argues, Western empire was brought about by small groups of frontiersmen separated from each other by great distances. These groups are the continuation of settler rangers destroying indigenous towns and fields and food supplies, most dramatically 30 million bison in the Northern Plains. Kaplan argues that the US Army was secondary in effectiveness compared to the settler rangers whom he equates to modern special forces. He acknowledges that the Army of the West provided lethal backup for settler counterinsurgency and slaughtering the buffalo, uh, the food supply of the Plains people, as well as making continuous raids on settlements to kill or hold hostage the families of indigenous fighters to force their surrender. Kaplan summarizes the genealogy of US militarism today in an essay titled, Indian Country, writing, whereas the average American at the dawn of the new millennium, the 21st century, found patriotic inspiration in the legacies of the Civil War and the World War II, when the evils of slavery and fascism were confronted and vanquished, for commissioned and non-commissioned officers in the US Army's, uh, the US Army's defining moment was fighting the Indians. From the beginning, the US was competitive in trade internationally and free trade, so-called, that is the right for the United States to be on any shore was the sacred quest then as it is today with US warships on every coast of the world. Take the famed US Marine Corps founded in 1775, a year after the 13 colonies formed the Continental Congress and army, a year before the Declaration of Independence, 13 years before the US Constitution was ratified forming the United States and 23 years before the US Navy was founded. It is the original killing uh, force that is uh, uh, federally supported and not uh, privatized. The following year, the Marines made their first landing capturing an island in the Bahamas from the British islands that remain today U.S. colony, the Bahamas. What in Marine Corps history is called Fort Nassau? Uh, I, uh, I suggest you go to the Marine Corps um, website because they're very proud of all this. You know, this isn't my deep research into some secrets. They're very proud of all these things. Uh, and uh, this was, um, then throughout the Revolutionary War, the Marines were then disbanded in 1783 and reorganized in 1794 as a branch of the Navy, but an autonomous branch. Uh, the Marines are the only um, war uh, element that does not have any kind of equipment under the other than their rifles, their riflemen. There are no um, paper pushers or anything else. They're all fighters with, um, with their individual weapons. 
So the character of a Marine is that of a colonial ranger created for counterinsurgency outside US secure territory. The opening lyric of the eternal official hymn of the US Marine Corps composed and adopted in 1847, soon after the invasion of Mexico and during the occupation of Mexico City is from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. Well, Montezuma, of course, was uh, um, the um, Mexico City, but Tripoli, uh, people never seem to be curious about what Tripoli's doing in there. Tripoli, Libya, okay. Tripoli refers back nearly a half century to the Barbary Wars of 1801 to 1805, the first Barbary War. When the Marines were dispatched to in 1801 to North Africa by President Thomas Jefferson to invade the Berber nation, carrying on this aggression, shelling the city, taking captives and marauding for nearly four years, ending with the 1805 Battle of Derma. It was there they earned the nickname Leathernecks for the leather high collars they wore as defense against the Berbers' saber cuts. The, uh, the Berbers didn't have firearms. They only had their sabers, but they were very good with them. And they won the first Barbary War, the Berbers did. And uh, the Marines left. So that was the first Barbary War, the ostensible goal of which was to persuade Tripoli to release U.S. sailors it held hostage and to end what the U.S. called pirate attacks on U.S. merchant ships. Actually, the Berbers were demanding that their sovereignty over their territorial waters be respected. The Berbers did not give up their demands and the Marines were withdrawn, returning a decade later in the Second Barbary War, 1815 to 1816 which ended with a Marine victory when the Pasha Yusuf Karamantli, the ruler of uh, Tripoli, agreed not to exact fees from US ships entering their territorial waters. The first military victory of overseas US imperialism or gunboat diplomacy as it comes to be called nearly a century later when historians mark the beginning of US overseas imperialism. They're a little late, a century late, not counting the Barbary Wars or Mexico. The Marines and military historians know better. Even when they write their books and leave it out, the historians know better. I know because in graduate school, you're taught to do that. If you do US history, the Marine Corps' second large engagement was the Second Seminole War, which raged from 1835 to 1842 in Florida. The longest war in US history declared war until Vietnam. This, the Second Seminole War during the Jackson administration has been identified with the extraordinary leader of the Seminole resistance, Osceola. It was all out war with the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps involved. Although they succeeded in killing Osceola, they lost the war as the Seminoles would not hand over the fugitive slaves, which is what was demanded of them. The military did, did succeed in deporting captives, mostly women, children, and old men to Indian territory. And there's still a Seminole reservation in Oklahoma of those descendants but uh, the Seminoles are still in the Everglades in uh, Florida. U.S. Armed Forces returned to try again in 1855, the Third Seminole War, but after four years of siege, lost again. And soon after, the Civil War and the end of the institution of slavery made further war against the Seminoles unnecessary. Of course, the Marine Corps branded with the halls of Montezuma, their trademark hymn composed while they occupied Mexico City in 1847. While the US Army invaded and occupied of what is now California, Arizona, New Mexico, 
the Marines invaded by sea and occupied Veracruz using counterinsurgent tactics in their march to Mexico City, burning fields and villages, murdering and torturing civilian resistors, hanging uh, the uh, Irish who changed sides uh, from the US Army they were conscripted into. They went over to the other side and they were also hung. They occupied Mexico City along with army divisions until the Mexican government under brutal occupation signed a dubious treaty transferring the northern half of Mexico to the United States in Marine Corps annals. Um, in the Marine Corps annals, the 1847 Battle of Chapultepec is legion, a battle in which a handful of teenaged Mexican cadets the, Chap, uh, the Chap, Chap, Chapultepec Castle was used as a military training school. So the cadets were in there uh, with few weapons and little ammunition. Teenagers held off the Marines, killing most of them over two days in endless fighting in the castle until the cadets themselves were all dead and the remaining Marines raised the U.S. flag and wrote their hymn tracing their genealogy to the invasion and occupation of Tripoli. Later in the century, Marine actions, particularly the infamous counterinsurgency in the Philippines and up to the present are well known, but they themselves take pride in their origins, which few US Americans, including leftists, know little or anything about. If they did, they would have to reconsider the mythology of the U.S. founding. So when you center the resistance of indigenous and the enslaved and other victims of U.S. counterinsurgency interventions and wars around the world, you're in fact doing U.S. history. And everything you thought you knew or theorized about the present and possible future melts into the air. The United States is a military state with an informally armed citizenry. Thank you. I hope I didn't go over my 30 minutes. <laughs> Absolutely not. This was so fantastic. Thank you so much, Professor Dumbar Ortiz, for offering this widespread, wide sweeping account of this horrific story and you know, so much resonance with our contemporary moment. There's a lot of people in the room with disparate relationships to the contemporary wars. And so I, I wanna bring in Gina here as a combat veteran, as somebody who um, has a, a particularly unique experience to weigh in here on what you're resonating with, uh, Gina. And, and I know, Gina, you have a series of questions that you've um, curated with our class as well. So please take it away. Well, thank you, Dr. Roxanne Dumber Ortiz. Um, it was very informative. Um, it did it made me feel guilty for serving in the military. Um, that's just, <laughs> just something that, you know, especially the Marines, um, it's very interesting to know. And it is true that the Marines do have a sense of pride. They, they really pound in the historical aspects of their history and to the recruits. And they take a lot of pride in that. And so it's very interesting hearing your what you were saying about their history. So but I do have a few questions for you. Um, first, I want to ask more about you. What drew you into activism and social movements? What inspired you to become a scholar activist into recording indigenous history as a form of activism? Well, as uh, you introduced me, I grew up in central Oklahoma. My father was a sharecropper and truck driver. Uh, my mother uh, doing whatever she could, odd jobs, a Southern Baptist rule. Uh, I wasn't meant to be an activist, obviously. Uh, we moved a lot in the county to various farms. And uh, my, but my father's father had been a labor activist in the early 20th century. Um, people don't know much about the Socialist Party at that time and the IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World. But they were very strong in um, in Oklahoma after it became a state in 1907, including a lot of uh, Muscogee uh, Creek people and Seminoles who were 
very involved uh, in it. There was a rebellion, the Green Corn Rebellion, that uh, put together um, uh, black uh, black farmers, white farmers, and um, and uh, um, mostly Creek and Seminole farmers uh, who were who didn't own land. They were tenant farmers or sharecroppers. Uh, and they revolted. It's called the, the Green Corn Rebellion, and of course it was put down. But I was always told about that. My father, my father was pretty young. He was born in 1907, and so that period he was uh, eight, nine, ten, 15, you know, up to 13 years old. The word, but he certainly had a memory of it, and uh, probably his father had told him a lot of stories too. But those stories of their valiant fighting and the Ku Klux Klan coming in and um, I just, you know, I really worshiped my grandfather. My father was not very progressive at all, although he was named by his father, Moyer Haywood Scarberry Pettibone Dunbar. Anyone who knows the IWW knows that those are the founders of the industrial workers of the world. And he was very proud of that name, but he said, uh, you know, the current left, they're different, you know, they're not like that at all. So he didn't approve of my activism, mm. but he had uh, he had uh, given me the platform for it. Uh, and I kept looking for anyone who was a rebel, I guess. Uh, and my last year of high school, they sent me off to a uh, trade school in Oklahoma City. And it happened to be the first year of uh, integration, uh, desegregate, well, desegregation, uh, integration. And of course, that very poor white uh, and working class school was chosen. Um, and there were fights, you know, and I saw the violence against uh, the white students against the uh, and teachers you know against the uh, few black students who obviously were part of the civil rights movement and very well trained on how to handle that kind of you know that uh, uh, nonviolent response which is very effective I so admired them the women especially they were so dignified and yet they made these uh, you know you know white kids look like idiots and uh, they were. Uh, so anyway, we began classes at 6 a.m. We got out at 11 and we all went to our jobs. And uh, so I didn't have that much time at school, uh, but it was, you know, it had a big uh, influence on me and it made me want to go to college. It made me want to uh, learn more uh, about the civil rights movement. And it was also on television, you know, the uh, uh, the explosion of the uh, of the church, you know, the black church that killed the little girls, and mm. these were, you know, uh, um, they uh, the Ku Klux Klan, of course, had formed again, and also in Oklahoma. So that was uh, I wanted to get out of Oklahoma, where I could really find radicals. Although my one year at University of Oklahoma, I did manage, I think, to meet every radical on campus. Let's say about six people, <laughs> and uh, uh, that was really great. One was a Palestinian uh, studying engineering, so I learned a lot about the world as well. Became a very early supporter of Palestinian liberation uh, in 1950. Five, um, lifelong, still with me. So it was. Um, I it, I think I just see it as really a lot of luck. I was looking, but I didn't know where to look. But it seemed to find me, you know. And I I have that sense. I had a mentor called and and Braden, you know, who is from uh, uh, from uh, Georgia. Well, she's from Mississippi. Very wealthy white woman who became a who married a communist labor organizer and became an activist. And uh, the first time I met her, I didn't know who to look for at the airport. She was meeting me and uh, she walked right up to me. We, we hadn't seen each other's pictures or anything. And she said, well, I said, how did you know who I was? And she said, well, in the moment you learn to spot your own kind, you know, so um, this was, I just had a lot of really good luck and, and mentors. And then of course I went to um, uh, San Francisco State and then UCLA and the Vietnam War got involved in the uh, anti-Vietnam War. There were 
exiled South African students there. So I got involved in the anti-apartheid movement. We had a student or first student organization against anti-apartheid in the United States uh, in 1965. So um, that was, you know, that was really um, how I, I just made a, a vow to myself. Uh, uh, I, I went to Cuba in um, 1970 on the Vince Ramos Brigade. And they have a saying of um, no se rende, no se vende, never sell out, never give up. So that was, you know, pretty much uh, what I was already thinking, but I, it was nice to put it into words as a, you know, just a, a sort of a, a vow. Well, thank you so much. It's very interesting. Um, you know, I'm, I'm glad. I'm really happy that you are on here and you have told us a little bit more about yourself. Because, you know, when you when you read your books, you know, we only see one certain aspect. You know, by it's it's always nice to know who the author is and right. where where you started and how you who you are now today. So. And my next question is, this program is about finding parallels between this history and the contemporary global war on terrorism. First, I want to ask your opinion on the present wars. Your talk resonated with this comparative framework, and we wonder if you would, if you could elaborate how you see parallels or continuations even between the two wars. Well, you mean the Iraq and Afghan wars? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, um, it goes back, of course, to uh, 1978, 79, 80. Uh, it, it actually goes back to um, the 50s, Afghan, uh, when the U.S. started intervening in Afghanistan. Of course, it had to do with the, so you know, the Cold War, the Soviet Union, and Afghanistan uh, being on the border of the Soviet Union. The United States wanted to control Afghanistan, and um, my uh, the, my husband. I married into a trade union family, and he had an uncle by marriage. His aunt's uh, his aunt's uh, husband, Ray Henson, who was a um, UN um, agrarian uh, expert, uh, sent to Afghanistan. Uh, to the UN wanted, you know, to introduce uh, cat, uh, crops, uh, food crops, because it was starvation in Afghanistan. Of course, the Brit British, as they tended to do, brought opium, mm -hmm. uh, as they did in China, as they did in India. <laughs> um, and uh, so opium production was, of course, very lucrative. And um, so to... Um, to convince you know the farmers that they needed to be able to feed their people and not so much talking against the opium production. I mean, it is a product, it can be a legal product as well for anesthesia and so forth. Um, and he was uh, then, you know, then the McCarthy thing came and he was, uh, he was fired, but he told me a lot about uh, that early period in Afghanistan, how the United States was, uh, not even allowing that kind of UN work to go on. Hmm. Um, so, we, you know, I wasn't too surprised when Afghanistan came back into the news in, you know, in 1978 and um, in 79. And, and then of course the, um, the proxy war that went on all during the eighties, pulling, you know, the, Brzezinski, you know, the, the uh, pulling uh, uh, the U.S. into um, uh, really kind of provoking the Soviet Union in, into uh, protecting their borders. And they had, of course, a, a, a president that was, was uh, linked uh, friendly to the Soviet Union. So they went in to uh, fight the Mujahideen that uh, the U.S. had been organizing and secretly, covertly organized. It wasn't very covert, but um, I was very distracted by them doing the same thing in Central America, you know, the proxy wars there, the Contra War in Nicaragua. And the, so I wasn't paying all that much attention to the, 
that period to my, you know, I really regret it because I knew what was going on. I was doing a lot of UN work, well, UN non-governmental organization work against militarism and for indigenous people's rights and, you know, anti-racism and all. So I, I, was, I was knowledgeable about what was going on. Um, but this, um, these, these two were parallel because in 1980, um, uh, the uh, Iraq, Saddam Hussein, uh, who kind of came in as a popular figure, but decide to ally with the United States. He, uh, and because I was at that time representing an organization called the Afro, uh, uh, Afro-Asian People Solidarity Organization that was based in Cairo, they were just going to, cause they were all Iraqis. The founder had been a, um, uh, had been a, an Egyptian, but he had been assassinated by the Muslim Brotherhood. And so the, they were all Iraqis. So they said, well, let's move to Baghdad, you know, and this was uh, um, Saddam Hussein seemed to welcome, you know, they'd gone there. And then he turned and, you know, and um, the US sort of put, you know, used it as a proxy to attack Iran. So that war went on for 10 years, the Iraq, uh, um, Iran, war it was devastating and we heard very little about it and especially uh um was uh you know was just deadly on both sides and and um then the u.s itself you know in 1990 um decided to start get rid of uh hussein which happens you know like in history i tell you know you ally with the united states and be careful because they they use you and drop you. And um, sure enough, uh, I turned against Saddam Hussein. So the invasion, the Gulf War. Um, so it's a long trajectory, actually, and they're parallel to each other. Um, so after 9-11, it, it was no surprise that both, you know, the first they invaded Afghanistan and then uh, Iraq. And I think people thought, well, yeah, for Afghanistan, that's okay, but why are they invading Iraq? But they had, they already had this dual thing going on, you know, for so many years, for decades, that that was normal, you know, for the U.S. military. And that's why it's hard, I think, for sometimes it's, you know, on the left and progressive, who else is going to be anti-war? and want these wars to stop and stop militarism to not understand that US persistence. Why are they doing that? You know, what is the point? What do they want there? I remember when, uh, you know, the Vietnam War uh, heated up and they started sending uh, troops rather than just, you know, counterinsurgency. They, um, all my, I was, you know, already very involved on the left, and people would say, "Well, what do, what resources do they want there? There must be offshore oil, or there must be uh, something, you know, that they want there." And I, you know, I didn't know all the things that I know now by any means, but I just had this this instinct that, well, well they want war. That's what they want. <laughs> you know, they want war, and so that. You know, I think that's hard to um, swallow sometimes that um, that's uh, that's the goal, you know, that's the objective is war. Yeah, it is very unfortunate because, um, you know, I have my own my own speculation of why we always keep going to war. Um, you know, I mean, for me, when I was in Iraq, you know, they have all these contractors and these contractors yeah. are making, you know, six figure Right. And, you know, they're building. I mean, I remember when I was in Taji, they were building all these, uh, you know, little modules. And, you know, and then after then about a year later, they closed that base down. Um, and so we wasted millions and millions of dollars yeah. and things like that. And it's just it's very sad. I mean, war is very profitable for, you know, certain people. Wow. But it's it's unfortunate for the soldiers that go over there and come exactly. back and, and they come with no legs or they have PTSD and, 
it's very sad and stuff like that. So, I mean, this is me on the hindsight of, you know, being 25 years. I mean, I wish I knew more about all of this. Maybe I would have thought long and hard not staying in, but, you know, it is what it is. So, but um, I have another question. I'm shifting gears here as a veteran artist and a veteran fellow. I would be interested in hearing more about veterans, indigenous or otherwise. Where do we see them in this history? How at times have they been agents or voices of solidarity and resistance? Yeah, well, you know, since the years of the war in Vietnam, I've worked uh, with veterans from US wars um, who become activists. The Veterans for Peace, of course, was founded a uh, form back then. And um, they, uh, and it, you know, it has grown with new generations of returning uh, combat vets. And then they've formed more, you know, the vets against uh, Iraq war and, and Afghanistan. Um, I believe that they are the most important voices that we have. Uh, when I was at UCLA and um, uh, during the height of the Vietnam War, well, the height, the 64 to 68, um, right next door to UCLA across the street from the west side of uh, the campus is the huge VA hospital where they brought the wounded Viet, uh, soldiers from Vietnam. So they had them hanging out on clotheslines. They had no limbs. They still, you know, the ones who still had their heads, their brains, but no limbs. So they would sun them. And we had a project, our anti-Vietnam War project, one of them on campus was to go and um, read to them and write letters uh, for them and, uh, and talk to them, you know, we wanted to hear everything they had to say. So I, you know, I didn't bother reading the papers or watching the news about that war. I, I listened to the veterans and I think that just the most important uh, sources for, um, uh, and the most important movement we have, I believe, are um, veterans of, of, uh, of these foreign wars who have come to be um, anti, uh, anti-war. Um, they were key to ending the war in Vietnam, the anti-war veterans who came back, Vietnam veterans against the war. I mean, some really lost their courage, like, like, um, uh, you know, some of the politicians and the ones who became politicians, but, um, they're still, you know, when I meet them today, gnarly old, Vietnam War vets, they're still at it. Um, my good friend, Brian uh, Wilson, of course, who um, is an endless uh, source of uh, inspiration to me. Um, so I, I really think they were key to ending the war in Vietnam and um, also Reagan's covert wars in Central America. They were uh, the ones who, you know, could really analyze what was going on um, and understand it. Um, I know when the Zapatistas had their uprising in 1994 and in, in uh, Chiapas, um, there was, uh, you know, when the Mexican government, the army was out there and everything uh, in 1998, uh, Brian Wilson formed a group of veterans to go down and look at the, um, their goal was to, they'd been asked to do this, to come down and look at the Mexican equipment to see if, uh, um, you know, the U.S. connection with that, you know, attack on the Zapatistas. So he invited me to go. I was really honored to go with these vets. So I spent I spent uh, 10 days, you know, in a cramped van, you know, uh, running around and purposely getting stopped by the um, Mexican army. Uh, it was their purpose. So we could get out and, you know, look at the, the guys could look at the equipment. And uh, one was a woman too. That So it was a very way, you know, to look at a situation through vet's eyes. So I think you and other vets uh, against war are just really, really important to 
uh, teaching. Um, Danny Surgeon, you know, and his his work is just amazing. He's a rock vet and uh, um, the organized about face and all. Um, these are to me the prophets and seers, you know, that we have among us. Yes, that's that's very true. I mean, you know, there's a lot of artists that you know return back and you know criticize the war and everything like that. Like for me, you know, when I was over there. I mean, I was very devastated to see that we left, you know, thousands and thousands of acres of trash yeah. and, you know, hump fees and, you know, you know, it was just unbelievable the amount and it was very sad, you know, it made me think, rethink about, you know, me wearing this uniform and like, what are we doing? I mean, we still do it today where we ship cargoes, you know, of stuff, you know, clothes and electronics that we don't need to third world country. I mean, we, we continually do this and yeah. it's, and it's very sad. So, but I have one more question. I think we have time for one more question. Um, continuing this conversation on solidarity and resistance. My art is therapeutic and a ritual to heal our mother earth. Can you speak to the tradition of indigenous people creating art as a practice of solidarity and resistance? How can we bring that into this conversation? Well, I think it's um, the art of, you know, solidarity. I got, I, I think it is very special with indigenous peoples. Um, it's this long memory, you know, passed down through, uh, really through oral history, uh, I learned, you know, when I, I was recruited by Vine Deloria uh, Jr. To, um, to be an expert witness at a, a, tr a treaty hearing of the Sioux Treaty of 1868. And I had just gotten my doctorate and, you know, I published uh, my dissertation. I, I mean, my dissertation was on history of land tenure in New Mexico. And I told him I know nothing. I mean, I wasn't in Native American studies or anything, you know, in my graduate work. I did Latin American and U.S. history and border, you know, basically U.S. imperialism. And um, I, I didn't really want to do U.S. history, but because the Southwest was part of Mexico, I, you know, I, I, I did that, but I didn't really um, want to do U.S. history. But I said, I knew nothing about, you know, the Northern Plains. I grew up in Oklahoma. I know something there, but those are, you know, like the the, the farming people from, from the Southeast who were forced to go there and people east of the Mississippi. And then of course, Comanches and Osages and all who are indigenous to it. But I didn't, I didn't even know much about that. And I said, you know, I'm not the right person. He said, he put, uh, an armload of papers. He says, I bet you're a quick study. So I studied the Sioux Treaty and I became an expert witness at this two week hearing in Lincoln, Nebraska, in federal court. And it was pretty amazing to me to see um, the entire community of Pine Ridge practically. Um, that came down from Pine Ridge. It's not that far to Lincoln, but they came down and, and set up an encampment along the Missouri River. And they, um, the lawyers, except for Brian Delory, were all white uh, and pro bono, you know, doing this work, very good people, National Lawyers Guild. And um, Every I didn't know it the first day, but that evening we went down to the river and there was this mass meeting where the lawyers sat and listened to what the people wanted to do the next day, how they wanted the lawyers to structure the uh, uh, the the the, the, the um, hearing. And I had you know I had uh, gone to law school for a couple of years and. I knew that that wasn't normal, you know, that wasn't the usual way to do things. <laughs> and it was just, just amazing. But then what really impressed me when I um, got involved with the International Indian Treaty Council, which formed in 1974 to the, do the UN work, was this solidarity with the liberation movements, with African liberation movements, with um, 
uh, with the Caribbean people, you know, of course, with other Native people of the whole hemisphere, and actually initiating uh, this big conference in 1977 at the United Nations Human Rights Headquarters in Geneva, uh, where the whole hemisphere of Indians, Indians of the Americas um, representatives came. And I had just, you know, I've been in a lot of movements, but I had never seen such, um, I, I don't know, um, every age group being involved as well. People brought their children, you know, and I had been on the anti-war left, the women's movement and all, and even in the women's movement, people tended to insist on childcare, you know, get rid of the children so we can talk. And that, I mean, there was a lot of crying and, you know, noise and everything with these meetings, but it, it was just, you know, I thought this is, this is really the, um, next to the, you know, the veterans, and many of them are Indian veterans, because Indian make up uh, far more than their percentage, you know, in being in the military. And um, I think, again, that, that uh, people have forgotten the 70s, how important uh, the Native movement was to people learning U.S. history that they didn't know, and that it's still very important. Um, it sort of seems to have, um, you know, with with the Donald Trump presidency, er, you know, everything shifted to uh, fear and chaos. But um, indigenous people are still, you know, still fighting for land, uh, land back, and uh, and for sovereignty and and for humanity, all humanity. Yes, I, I totally agree. Um, you know, as a as a teacher, um, you know, I had a question on a board for my students. I said, how is an ignorant person created? And it was very interesting to hear, um, you know, these kids ponder upon these questions and reflecting. And um, it's gave me a sense of hope that they are aware of what's going on. And I told them, I said, you have to be, you have to know what's going on. Because, you know, I primarily teach immigrants, you know, mostly Me Mexican kids and, yeah. you know, it's, and I know that they struggle and, and I say, you got to know, because a lot of you are going to be turning 18. You have to know what's, what you're voting into office. Um, yeah. So, but I want to thank you very much. Um, yeah, it was very you. informative, informative, and thank you for answering my questions. Um, I wish you. I could spend more time with you and one-on-one -on -one somewhere and we could have more conversations. So, but thank you so much. Good. Thank you, Gina. Thank you, Gina. This has been so wonderful. So I feel like a fly on the wall getting to hear this conversation between the two of you <laughs> and Roxanne, your life history and the way that it is intertwined with the, you know, latter half of the 20th century and all of the most radical left movements of that period and your encyclopedic knowledge about the history of insurgency and resistance is so meaningful. When is the memoirs coming out? A lot of folks are asking in the Q&A, when, when, are, when are you writing that work? We, we would love to read that. And um, there's, I just wanna lift up some thoughts that are coming up in the Q&A as we move towards conclusion. Uh, a lot of people are just offering their, their praise and thanks Dr. Dunbar Ortiz for your work, for the decades of documentation and historical work that you brought to these questions. A lot of folks are asking about, and I think, you know, you got to it, you know, that history of anti-war and war resistors within the veterans movement. And it's specifically in relationship to the veterans of the global wars on terror. How has that shifted from the Vietnam era? And how can we talk about um, the way in which uh, disproportionately people of color and indigenous people who serve, as you rightly pointed out in the military have a kind of special knowledge and that allows us to think about these wars in this synergetic way. And you know, one of the goals of this project that's all culminating with the art triennial, the veteran art triennial in March of 2023 is to really explore a lot of what you laid down around this history of these insurgencies and these counterinsurgencies, um, but then also the for forms of resistance that we're seeing and reanimation that uh, Native and Black and other people of color artists who have these complex genealogies are trying to think through in their art making as Gina is. And Gina will be one of the featured 
artists at that triennial come March. So I hope folks will stay tuned for that. I also just want to name that, you know, this is the first talk in our series, as we mentioned at the beginning of our session, um, and that Dr. Kyle Mays will be joining us from UCLA um, next month on Thursday, October 13th. And I hope folks will consider registering. Zainab will drop a, a link to the Eventbrite registration in the chat in just a moment. Um, I wanna make sure, and so, and Aaron has posted up a bunch of slides for us here as, as we move towards conclusion. I wanna make sure there's nothing else that came through in the Q&A that I really need to name. Folks are just offering praise to you too, Gina, for the really thoughtful questions and correspondence. And so we're so grateful for this kind of collaboration and the opportunity to have both of you in conversation. Any final words, Gina or Roxanne, that you wanna share or any, any of my co-conspirators, if anyone wants to come on camera and off on mic, this would be the moment to do so as we move towards conclusion. I wanna, I wanna concur with Ronick. Um, you are really an encyclopedia of knowledge. <laughs> you really, I mean, you really lived through a time. And, you know, I remember when you were mentioning about the opium, I mean, I was only like eight. I mean, I, ba I vaguely remember that, you know, and it's just, I just, I just, I'm always amazed by, you know, people who have so much knowledge and who have endured all of this history. I mean, you really definitely have to write a memoir. I think it's, you've lived through a lot of things that, it's, it needs to be noted. Um, a lot of things that are not told in history books. I mean, it's just, and it's getting crazy with the history. I mean, you know, a lot of states are condemning student. I mean, teachers from teaching about slavery and history. I mean, it's just so sad. I mean, luckily I'm in California. I still have a freedom to speak and say what I want to do. And so I'm really doing my best to make my students to become informed and know what's going on in the world because, um, they need to know. I mean, it's it's really, we're living in a really crazy radical time and they got to be the voice. They got to they gotta be fighters just like you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dina. Well, I'm happy to announce that I actually have written not just one, but three works of me memoir. <laughs> they were published in Red Dirt, Growing Up Oki is about you know the first uh, 20 years of my life in Oklahoma. And um, Outlaw Woman, a memoir of the war years, 1970 to um, uh, 1960 to 75. Uh, and you know, the anti-war move when I became an activist. And then uh, Blood on the Border, a memoir of the Contra War. They are all, they were all published by different small presses, but they have now gone to uh, all of them, University of Oklahoma Press. Well, thank you for that deep dive in your citational history. We'll, we'll have to brush up on our reading groups and our study groups, absolutely, of those texts. And, and maybe we can get a, a, a fourth text as well for this early 21st century period in which- um, Yeah, I, there are quite a few, 30 years have, gone by since uh, the last <laughs> memoir ended I'll, so I'll maybe one, i will one more thing since we have a couple minutes is you know as a scholar of race and empire in the middle east i so appreciated your deep dive in that global long global cold war history that 70s moment of u.s intervention of mm -hmm. and, and really thinking about how that laid this the seeds and the roots for everything that happened post 9 11 of course and you know one of the things we're trying to disturb in this series is the idea that you know the global war on terror wasn't a only a 21st century phenomenon. In fact, no, it's really the late 20th century when a lot of that, yeah. those currents were laid for us. And that, you know, I think one of the things that's missing in our discussions about 21st century warfare is that the residue and sort of ghosts of these American Indian wars continues to permeate all exactly. other kinds of counterinsurgencies and, and, and militarized efforts that, you know, extend to this moment, into this decade. So thank you so much for laying all that out for us here, mm -hmm. something that we hope to explore all year round. I want to just, again, if everyone in the, everyone who's with me here on the panelists can just give our love and affirmation to both Gina and Roxanne, and thank you so thank much you. for your time. Much thank blessings. you. Stay tuned for more, folks. Bye. Thank oh. you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.